Any questions? Well, I, I just like to say thank you. I, it's really incredible for me to have work, photographic works that I know so well, um, addressed by someone whose area of specialization is so different. And so to hear you talk about, for instance, that Mark Klett picture with the ATV scar and put it into a context that you see it, I mean, it just it provides such additional depth and I'm, I'm really glad to know these things about these pictures. And I love the um, catastrophism versus uh, uniformitarianism. uniformitarianism um, expanded. I mean, I, it's fascinating to know that those same issues that were a concern during O'Sullivan's time are part of the dialogue today. So, so thank you very much for all the time and attention you've given this lecture. Your work with LIDAR and the, how the Dodge dunes is, well, you know, let's understand why those dunes, if they're moving that quickly, why they aren't in New Jersey yet. <laughs> why those stay there? Yeah, right. Good question. Yeah, so, well, um, so in the case of well, so in the case of the Salton Sea, which is the one that I'm talking about, there there's a there's a body of water there that's just, that's just taking those dunes. So the dunes do originate upstream, and there's a there's a place um, called Ocotillo Wells State Vehicular Recreation Area. It's actually a yarding field. So a yarding field is actually a place where aeolian erosion occurs. And I've also done some laser scanning of those yardings. But there's actually a well-defined source region for the sand that feeds the Salton Sea dunes, and then the Salton Sea itself is ultimately the place of demise. So in that case, it's sort of a closed system because you've got a source region, a dune field, and then ultimately a place where those sands can, can go underwater. Uh, in the case of the Algod Algodones dunes, uh, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know the history of that dune field as well to, to speak to that. Yeah. Yeah. I would just characterize uh, human impacts, uniformitarian or catastrophic? <laughs> <laughs> In geologic time, it's certainly catastrophic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is there any organization in the West that's using citizen phenology to add to this kind of database of photography? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. For ge yeah, for geomorphology. <laughs> yeah, but I do know that in general, so, so there are regional phenocam networks, and there are, there's an attempt, as I, as I mentioned, at a global phenocam network. And one, as a citizen science, scientist, can add your phenocam to that database. So I don't know if there's an organized effort to recruit citizen science in that regard, but it's certainly possible as a citizen scientist to become involved and volunteer your data to these global networks. And what's really exciting about that is that the global networks are, are analyzing the imagery in a consistent way. So you've got, you know, thousands of phenocams, each one has you know, tens of thousands, you know, large numbers of photographs. And so people can extract time series of greenness indices, for example, from every single phenocam. So you can not only provide your data, you can see how you know, a, a, a scientist is actually going to distill that data into something that can be compared to other sites and compared within your site over time. So I think that's exciting as a citizen scientist. And then you can be involved in that work too because you can <laughs> You can comment on you know, whether it works for your particular site, because you as a citizen scientist know, knows it better than anyone else, of course. And as a follow-up, um, yeah. is there anything when you're going back in history to read a photograph, and you're doing it today, is there a translation on things like um, focal length of camera lens that would be useful uh, to compare back to the large view camera shots or even ratio of the photograph, like a four to three ratio or something like that. Yeah. I'm going to punt to Becky on that one. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you talking about, like, di digital capture? Yeah, I was wondering how uh, our current photographers that are re-photographing, are they, are they, they tend to be using uh, 50 millimeter lenses, you know, real eyeball kind of lenses, uh, a four to three ratio, which is closer to square. Well, and I can speak to Mark Klutz's practice, um, that he, part of what he's trying to do is match all of that. So, um, you know, he'll get to a site, and the goal is to put the lens right where the earlier lens was. Um, 
He's working with a different camera size in some cases, but yes, he's trying to match the edges of the frame, so he needs to be working with the same ratio. Um, and there are times that he's there and he's got the wrong lens. Once he gets there, he's like, oh, they were, total, they were working with a much wider angle lens than I can address with the camera that I've got. And there are instances where he went back with a different lens because he wanted to, to most closely approximate what the original photographer had done. Uh huh. Certainly. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the origins and the history of photography as a scientific practice. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know the history. Right. So I, I guess. I guess that. Um, I think that. I think that there are folks who you know so. In science, there are people who tend to work in the field and tend to work in the people who tend to work in the lab. I'm more of sort of a computer geek myself, but I think the people who are out in the field, they know the history. So I, I'm familiar with with Robert Webb, Bob Webb of the USGS, who wrote a book called Grand, Grand Canyon: A Century of Change. And his work and the work of his collaborators, he had a large team of collaborators. He was working in the Grand Canyon. He knew the history really well. And I think it was a pretty obvious idea. He was looking at ecological change in the Grand Canyon. So I think it was a pretty, pre I mean, he's a smart guy, don't get me wrong, but it was, it was a pretty simple idea to think, okay, there's this history of early expeditions, particularly the Stanton ex expedition, that, that can be leveraged in a very direct way. And so he would, he would go to some of these sites because he was doing river rafting trips down the Grand Canyon as part of his work. And he would visit these sites and I, you know, he would just start to photograph them you know, just, just by chance. And then over time, he thought, okay, well, I should do this in a more systematic way, right? And so I don't know if he was the first to do it, but he was the first person that I became aware of in terms of scientific re-photography. So he was doing other kinds of monitoring work at the same time, knew the history, started taking the photographs, started noticing interesting changes, and just said, okay, we have to document this in a systematic way. So that's my sense of how individual folks have come upon this in different regions, Bob Webb in the Grand Canyon being one of them. And then I think there's just been this sense in, among the community more recently, particularly with regard to tracking vegetation changes, this has to be coordinated at a global or regional first and then at a global scale so that we don't lose data or data that's sitting out there doesn't get used. You know? So as scientists, we're starting to think not just about how do we collect as much data as possible, but how do we not lose data? You know, we're spending taxpayer money in many cases to collect data. So how do we collect that data in a way that is useful to others, you know, as who may, may be interested in something completely different than what we're interested in, the narrow scientific focus that we're interested in, but also how do we present it in a large database that allows other people to mine it and also just to make sure that it doesn't get lost. So that's sort of the next step that I tried to allude to of these sort of global databases. And I think that's the most exciting thing more recently. Maybe just one more question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm very fascinated with the fact that you can take this laser scanning equipment and place it precisely where you utilized it before, and then over time get this incredibly detailed graphic image of what's happening in this space and um, in the geology three dimension. You, three-dimensional methods. Have you or your colleagues started to use some of this data to create VR environments that show this activity taking place as a result of change in time in a way that it can be perceived almost in real time, sped up, slowed down, uh, change the uh, various uh, things that might happen climatically, temperature-wise, uh, to actually visualize this in a manner that might persuade those that have no concept of what climate change is that it really is happening. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I haven't seen much attempt at virtual reality, but it's the way to, you know, it's certainly something, something to consider and something to do. So I think that... Um, yeah, and, and having good three-dimensional maps of landscapes and allowing them to be tracked over time is, uh, is a great idea. So I, I like your suggestion, but I ha I'm not aware of it being done as of yet. Yeah. We've already got the data.
the data to people who have the capability of taking that data and constructing those three-dimensional models in a visual space. It's awesome. It's totally awesome stuff, and, and I highly uh, recommend exploration in that direction as well. Yeah. There's a possible sort of simple corollary solution to that question. Uh, there's a photographic study over time, a psychotechnology study, same place, same environment, where people go back and re-photograph the interior of a deserted factory. Time and time again over a three-year period, exactly the same point as um, graffiti artists went in and took it over. And so all of those were put in a database and the timelines along the bottom of the web page. So you can drag your finger right along the timeline and watch the whole thing change as rapidly as you like. Watch it change. And it's just stacking those images one right on top of the other. Very simple, but very effective. <coughs> Uh, I hate to cut off the questions, but we actually have a second lecture happening in the auditorium here tonight, so we need to do our quick change around, but thank you again.